You know, I really thought this video was going to be about a monster. That's why I planned it for Halloween. I've been hearing about the King in Yellow for ages, and despite all the books and games and references it's cropped up in, I feel like I've never really understood what it is. Like, they always make it sound like some kind of big tentacly demon, but it somehow feels wrong beside Cthulhu and H.P. Lovecraft's other space octopus gods. Well, perhaps against my best judgment, I finally went and read the source material. The original book. Turns out, the King in Yellow isn't really much of a monster at all. Really, it sort of says that we are. We writers. In case you didn't know, until the end of the month, we're giving away free Taloid keychains to everyone who joins our Patreon at the $10 tier. And there are only a few days left, so if you do want to get one this way, now's the time. Or, if you'd rather just get one directly, they're also available for just $15 in our merch store. To everyone who already decided to buy one, and to all of our current patrons, thank you so much. You really help us to keep making these videos. We love you. If you have no idea what any of this is, don't worry. You're probably not alone. Most people who know of the King in Yellow know it as a tentacled elder god invented back during the pulp sci-fi boom. To them, it's a distinct alien entity. I guess it's sort of become that, but the true version of the King in Yellow is really a book of short stories written by the author Robert W. Chambers around the turn of the 20th century. All the tales in the book are connected by a fictional play also called The King in Yellow, which, in the world of the book, is known for its remarkable influence. In the stories, the play has been censored, condemned, and banned by almost every public organization, not because it contains anything immoral, but because it has the power to change its readers in ways that are hard to fathom. It has spread through the world, quote, like an infectious disease, to the point where almost everyone interested in the arts has at least heard of it, if not read bits and pieces. I wouldn't really describe the stories in this book as scary, or even existential like a lot of H.P. Lovecraft's work. They're just… weird. It's hard to say how exactly, but there's this dissonant quality to them. Watching how the play affects the characters in their lives somehow gives me this sense of… repulsion? Like my mind is trying to reject something before I even know what that something is. And it all begins with a poem in the book's dedication. Along the shore the cloud waves break. The twin suns sink behind the lake. The shadows lengthen in Carcosa. Strange is the night where black stars rise, and strange moons circle through the skies, but stranger still is lost Carcosa. Songs that the Hyades shall sing, where flap the tatters of the king, must die unheard in dim Carcosa. Song of my soul, my voice is dead. Die thou unsung as tears unshed shall dry and die in lost Carcosa. Casilda's Song and the King in Yellow, Act 1, Scene 2 I know that must sound like a lot of beautiful gibberish right now. It certainly did to me the first time I read it, but that's part of the intrigue. It sets a tone of disorientation and foreboding, depicts a world we can't quite grasp, where suns sink behind lakes, where souls have songs which the deadened voice can no longer sing. The impression is deep, but you can hardly articulate where it comes from, and that confusion is important. After this one fleeting glimpse of the play, the strangeness of it still marinating in our minds, the first actual story in the book begins. It's called The Repairer of Reputations, and it's where people seem to draw most of their inspiration for The King in Yellow from. It's about a man named Hildred Castain who, after reading the play for the first time, becomes embroiled in a cultish plot to overthrow the US government. He's convinced by a professional blackmailer who keeps a massive network of debtors that he is the rightful heir to the throne of the King in Yellow. Together, they plan to erect an Imperial Dynasty of America built after the fashion of the lost Imperial Dynasty of Carcosa from the play. They believe that as the influence of the play has spread, the nation has become ready for an uprising, and that in the end, they will welcome Hildred as their new king. As this delusion takes hold, he becomes ever more sensitive about his mental health, 
lashing out at anyone who expresses worry for him. Before long, he's turned against everyone he loves. He's even willing to have his own cousin killed because he believes the man to be before him in the line of succession, and thus the one thing blocking the way to his promised kingdom. Of course, this all ends in tragedy for our deluded hero. The sad coup engineered by minds fractured and perverted through study of the play inevitably unravels at the seams. As the authorities take him away to the asylum, he experiences one final moment of tragic clarity and shouts to his baffled cousin, Ah, I see it now. You have seized the throne and the empire. Woe, woe to you who are crowned with the crown of the king in yellow. A bit of an about face there to go from wanting to be the king in yellow to crying out the woe of anyone who is crowned the king. But this theme of ruination in the promised paradise is one we're going to see play out over the course of the book. Speaking of which, the second story, and my personal favorite, is called The Mask. It's shockingly romantic for something so grim, but before it starts, it also gives us one of the only other excerpts from the play itself that we ever get. Camilla, you, sir, should unmask. Stranger, indeed. Casilda, indeed, it's time. We all have laid aside disguise but you. Stranger, I wear no mask. Camilla, terrified, aside to Casilda, no mask, no mask. The King in Yellow, Act 1, Scene 2. Hold on to that. You really needed to understand this one. The story is one of longing and change and destiny. Alec is an artist with a circle of friends that he treasures above all else. One of them, Boris, is incredibly wealthy, living on a grand estate and funding novel experiments in the fields of art and chemistry. He even finds a new element that, in its liquid form, can turn living things into beautiful rose marble statues almost instantly. Another of Alec's dear friends, Genevieve, is the love of his life, but she's also Boris's lover. For all of their sakes, Alec does his best to be supportive of them in their relationship, pretending that it doesn't pain him. He calls this effort his mask, and it reminds him of the pallid mask from the play. Just like in the excerpt, he feels that the mask has stopped being a mask and become a part of him. Over the course of the story, as it becomes clear that his friends have also read the play, fate seems to reshuffle its hand for him. Genevieve throws herself into a pool of Boris's statue-creating fluid because of the agony of her repressed love for Alec. Boris takes his own life and leaves his entire estate to Alec. Another of his friends travels abroad and becomes possessed with the idea that Alec is someone of terrible importance, rushing back to see him. And finally, it's revealed that the effects of the statue chemical do not last forever. Genevieve returns to life, and with no obstacles between them, she and Alec at last find their love. The impression is one of a prince coming into his inheritance. As Alec dons the mask and at last becomes one with it, he takes the role of the interloper in that excerpt from the play we read earlier, the one we would assume to be the King in Yellow. And leaving behind a trail of madness and death, his world seems to rush the crown onto his head. The third story is quite a bit simpler than the first two, but it's also very important. It's the only one that actually seems to embrace the entity of the King in Yellow rather than just the influence of the play. But even then, the king himself seems to be more of a symbol than anything. The story is called The Court of the Dragon, and it follows a man who, having read the play, seeks the comfort of a familiar church house. But something is wrong. While the pastor gives a decidedly strange sermon on how nothing can harm the soul, the organ music becomes dissonant, disturbing, almost nausea-inducing. When the man looks at the organist to see who would play such a tune, he finds himself met with the most hateful gaze he's ever experienced. He hurries out of the place, but the strange, pale organist follows him into the night, stalking him all the way home. He's gripped by the notion that somehow this man is death itself and that there is no escape. When he's finally captured, he is not killed, but spirited away to another world, the ruined land of Carcosa, where the towers rise behind the moon and the cloud waves break, the awful abode of lost souls. 
And for the first and only time, we encounter the King in Yellow himself, who wraps the protagonist in radiance as he approaches, saying, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I suppose that once the truth of the play has you, there is no God left to turn to, no comfort left to find. You are as good as lost. And finally, our fourth story, after which the play is hardly, if ever, mentioned again in the book. The Yellow Sign. Again, if you're a fan of the Cthulhu mythos, this should be ringing some bells. And I'll admit, this one is pretty pulpy compared to the others. But it's also different in another important way. The main character, Mr. Scott, has not read the play. In fact, he's sworn it off entirely, knowing how it's influenced people like the late Hildred Castain, who was his friend. But the play is very insistent. Throughout the story, Scott is haunted by a strange, bloated, pale, corpse-like man whose very presence makes it impossible for him to create his art. At the same time, he and his lover are both plagued by dreams of his death. One night, not knowing what she's done, she brings him a brooch she's found in the street. It bears a strange yellow symbol which belongs to no known language of man. And as if this were an invitation, the King in Yellow suddenly appears in Scott's library. As they both succumb to its lure, reading it and discussing it in a daze, the corpse-like man comes upon them like the Reaper. He rots the door's lock at a touch, kills the girl, and then collapses into a pile of fetid flesh, finally at rest. When the authorities arrive, they say that the man must have been dead for some time already. The story ends with Scott, in psychiatric care, praying for death. But the prayers are cut short, and we never find out why. So it looks like the play is more than just a weird piece of literature that drives you mad. It really does seem like a virus, working through the will of the ones it touches to make itself known, even to those who wish not to know it. I wonder if its author even really had a choice. After this story, the rest spiral off into what feels like pretty aimless romanticism. Art Nouveau, culture in Paris, wartime ruminations on the nature of love, prophetic vignettes, time-traveling lovers, but hardly anything else about the King in Yellow. It's hard to know why these are in the collection at all, but there they are. And still, even in just these first four stories, my goodness, there is a lot to find. I could go on for a very long time about my personal thoughts and interpretations, the philosophical implications of all afterlives vanishing, a usurper god slipping in to take their place, the journey of the soul becoming terminal rather than something transcendent. But I really don't think that's the point of the play in these stories. I think the play is actually something far more concrete and surprisingly relatable. To me, it serves as a demonstration not just a powerful piece of literature unto itself, but a show of what words can truly do. An example of the pinnacle of language's power to influence the ones who read or hear it. In the version of the book I read, there's a foreword by the writer Nick Pizzolatto who explains this so beautifully. The idea of magic words has always felt misunderstood to me. The magic is not in the words themselves or any particular word because they are, after all, empty vessels. The magic is only ever using the right words in the exact right way. The secret knowledge lies in arranging, say, the 26 symbols of our English alphabet into a configuration which reliably produces an intended effect upon the audience, perhaps and even especially against that audience's wishes. Configurations most commonly categorized as story, poem, lyric, or play. Then there's no end to the capabilities of language and its power over human beings, its ability to engender the most overwhelming emotional states. Put words to music, and the entire world can move. We writers know this. We're almost obsessive about it, always searching for the right words, trying to create the perfect effect. It's our way of working true magic, and we can be so wrapped up in it, we don't stop to consider the unintended consequences. Think of the play. Think of its dark, corrupting message. As readers, we don't know what that message actually is, only that it wants to spread. I don't think that's particularly unique. After a fashion, I'd say that all information wants to spread. And language is its primary vector. Be careful what you release into the world. 
You aren't responsible for what people take from your work, but you are responsible for what you give. Love your art enough not to make it a vector for falsehood, evil, hatred. Love your words enough to choose them well. And that would be where the video ends, except I have more to say. There's a whole missing section of this video about my interpretation of the play itself. I discuss the original short story that inspired it, as well as some references to mythology to figure out what it actually may be about. It's a little beside the point and very speculative, so we ultimately had to trim it for time, but I couldn't quite let it all go. I had to keep a full version of the video out there somewhere. It seemed right. Thankfully, there is a place where we can share that stuff, where we don't have to worry about streamlining our content so it's a perfect fit for attention spans and algorithms. You can watch it over on our creator-owned streaming platform, Nebula. YouTube is a weird place for educational content. It's hard to be as honest and open as you want to while trying to satisfy the algorithm and trying to dodge some kind of terrible fate like channel-wide demonetization, which has actually happened to us before. So a bunch of us educational creators got together and made our own platform where we don't have to worry about all of that. You can find all of our videos there ad-free and full of additional content we normally have to cut out for YouTube including the extended version of this video. And we're not the only ones. The same is true for so many other amazing creators. It's basically our safe haven for the material we wish we could share here. There's usually a few weeks between uploads, so if you want more Tail Foundry in the meantime, come join our community. We have a Discord server that's basically like a big family of creatives. A lot of love there. So many writers and artists have made it their home, and we would love to have you as well. You can find links to it in the description. Hope to see you there. Until then, thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next time. Bye.